Hi, welcome back to the Coda podcast. I'm Molly Flower. And I'm Roger Harris. Here's a podcast from our Coda 22 event, which I think we really feel it was our best content yet. It was our best event yet. And it was so good to see everyone back together again after such a long hiatus, right? <laughs> so good. It was friggin' awesome yeah. to be back together. Um, so much to be proud of. Agreed. Maybe our best content ever. And how about having a uh, climate active or Australian government climate active certified carbon neutral event. That's a first. It was one hell of an achievement that. Massive achievement and there'll be lots more on the website that you can track down about how we did that. So please go to the website, check out the other podcasts and video content, the YouTube channel um, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and do share it with your network, tag us on socials and spread the word because this is the last Coda event and it's been one hell of a ride so thank you for everybody who's been part of it. Yeah, an absolute privilege to have been part of it. For more more on the sort of winding up of Coda, check out on the website and uh, hope to see you all soon. Um, so for the next talk, we are going to venture into the thorny arena of gender issues. Uh, it feels only a very short time ago that we had the veil lifted from our eyes about the, you know, the profound inequality in some areas of, of, of gender. Um, you know, the, we've all just had gender wage gap week where we realised once again that there's a significant um, disparity um, and things like equipment all being designed with the male body uh, in mind. Um, so to discuss today gender and acute coronary syndromes, we are very honoured to have uh, Dr Gemma Figtree, who is a professor in medicine at the University of Sydney um, and an interventional cardiologist. Her bio is deeply deeply impressive, encompassing a phenomenal research and publication history, as well as that clinical role as interventional cardiologist. And we're so grateful to have you here with us today, Gemma. Um, Dr. Gemma Figtree. Thank you very much. I feel very honoured to be here, and I'm glad Daniel's actually manning the fort back at North Shore, uh, in fact, on my ward, as we mentioned. Uh, so... I did have hair a couple of weeks ago. Um, I am a cardiologist at North Shore and I work on, in the cath lab looking after patients with heart attacks. I've also recently begun to experience life as a patient, unfortunately more from a cancer perspective, which I think actually has huge kind of connection to the talk that I want to share with you today. So I am currently day four in my second round of chemo at the moment, which is... Um, not actually that much fun to be, uh, to be kind of sold around the place, but I guess a few of you are probably asking, well, you know, what are you doing here, flying from Sydney, packing yourself into the back of a Qantas aeroplane at seven o'clock in the morning? And um, I think it probably reflects how much I really care about this particular topic, and I really want to thank um, you for having me here today, and also Roger for inviting me. And it wasn't all just about the funky black T-shirt, which I'll definitely treasure for a long time. So this is the front page of Time magazine back in 2003. And what you can see here is highlighting the fact that women don't really appreciate the fact that heart disease is one of the biggest killers, in fact, the biggest killer of women in the world. And at this point, uh, you can see here that in Iraq, we've actually got uh, Saddam still alive and being searched for. So what's come, well, where have we come since 2003? Well, cardiovascular disease still remains the leading cause of mortality in women. And you can see the deaths here from the United States, in particular looking at cardiovascular disease, about tenfold that of breast cancer in 2016. And what is driving this? It's ischemic heart disease and stroke. And there's an enormous disparities here, and I apologise about the size of the font, but you can see across many of the, the countries where we have lower socioeconomic status, it's really driven by ischemic heart disease and stroke up there. And the little blue squares you can st still see are rheumatic heart disease as well, and many of the other conditions such as heart failure and atrial fibrillation. What is driving this? Very similar to what we see in men. In women, it's high fasting glucose, 
high blood pressure and high LDL. But it's actually particularly hypertension that's having a, 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 um, a, a, a kind of major impact, particularly in third world and Asian countries, driving that risk of coronary artery disease and cardiovascular death. Now, shockingly, despite the fact that since 2003 we've been actually in the headlines trying to raise awareness about heart disease in women, we actually are seeing a rise in mortality, particularly in the younger women. And this is not just in countries where we've got lower socioeconomic standards. Here we actually can see the data from the USA, Canada and Australia, and you can see the increase of age-standardised cardiovascular deaths in the 35 to 74-year-old group. So what is it? What are we doing in our country that is not recognising and preventing some of the, the biggest killer in our country that is completely preventable? So what do women think they're going to die of? 40 to 60 percent in most surveys think they're going to die of breast cancer. What do women actually die of? Over 50 percent of women around the world are actually dying of cardiovascular disease. And this includes both heart attack, stroke, heart failure and arrhythmia. So what is it that's different in women to men that makes us think that we need to do something differently? Part of it is certainly socio-cultural, but some of it's actually also biological. And so we might be talking about gender, we might be talking about sex. Both of these things actually have slightly different imp imp implications when it comes to, to the heart. What you can see here is just some biological schematics demonstrating the acute and chronic effects that oestrogen can have in the cardiovascular system. In the premenopausal time, oestrogen actually has very protective effects of the cardiovascular system. This leads to improvements in lipid profiles compared to with the removal of oestrogen. It also improves vascular tone, endothelial function, and actually blood pressure as well. And some of these effects are actually mediated by traditional genomic mechanisms acting on the nucleus to upregulate genes. But also, oestrogen has an amazing effect in the cardiovascular system to acutely relax blood vessels. And you can actually see this graph here was actually taken from my honours thesis probably about 30 years ago when I actually still cared about this too. So you can see the, the acute relaxing effect of oestrogen when you actually drop it onto a coronary artery that's actually strung up to measure pressure. So these effects are happening in women all the time. So what is it that we need to be looking for to better predict who's at risk of suffering from cardiovascular disease? In, in the case of women, what we can see is that there's some of these things are sex specific. So we have premature menopause as one particular example. We have diabetes, in particular gestational diabetes, hypertensi hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and preterm delivery. Interestingly also, a small for gestational aged child is actually a risk factor for developing future cardiovascular disease. And why is this? Well, it is actually partly to do with the fact that the same kind of physiological adaptation that needs to happen during pregnancy can actually be a stress test for a future risk of cardiovascular disease. And so there's all of these early opportunities for us to actually identify women who may be at risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And certainly many of those that develop gestational diabetes or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, it's our responsibility when they leave after having had a child to make sure that they've actually got that appropriate follow-up. But in addition to some of these more biological effects, we've also got under-recognised risk factors that are impacting women's risk of heart disease right around the world. This includes psychosocial psycho risk factors, but also um, loneliness, um, poor health literacy that can really affect women, socioeconomic deprivation, and also environmental risk factors. I really love this figure. The red square is what I want you to focus on. And what it shows is that traditional risk factors, in this case um, the Q risk or the Framingham risk score that many of you would have heard of, consist of algorithms that include cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking and diabetes, as well as family history. But you can see in the case of the red square, in both men and women, at an individual level, 
Many people suffer cardiovascular events that actually don't have any risks of these at all. And so some of this reflects atypical risk factors, and some of it reflects the missing biology. So all the people in that little red square, in this case women, are actually not predicted to suffer an event, but yet they do. So how can we get better at this? And this is actually something that we can learn from cancer a lot. I mean, I think in the last 20 years, looking at the change of outcomes of women with, with breast cancer, and in fact all patients with cancer, has been phenomenal. And part of it is because we're taking a better approach to the early detection of the fundamental underlying disease. And in the case of coronary artery disease, this is the atherosclerosis itself. And till now, we've not really been able to easily pick up the plaque itself. Here you see three examples of patients, some of who you know from the media, and another two who I've encountered from my own clinical practice. The two who you don't know, one is Jen and one is Scott. Jen was actually in her mid-30s when she suffered from an acute coronary syndrome. It actually took her two or three times before someone actually took her seriously and she was then actually taken through and, and had appropriate revascularization. You might actually ask, it's both the case of Jen and Scott, why, in fact they were asking, why me? None of them, they didn't have any traditional risk factors, they were young, They'd been to their GP the month before and had a complete clean bill of health. Coronary artery disease at a community level is predicted by risk factors, but at an individual level is not. And in this particular case, this is a classic example of exactly the opposite. Why not me? What I'm trying to say here is we don't actually understand everything about susceptibility and resilience to coronary artery disease in humans. We actually investigated this at our local site and found an astonishing fact that up to 25% of our patients coming through with first-time heart attacks actually didn't have any traditional risk factors at all. And this is actually just worse in, in women. And what you can see here is that if you developed coronary disease and a heart attack without traditional risk factors, you had a 50% higher chance of being dead at 30 days. Now, this is partly related to differences in treatment that you received if you were perceived not to be at high risk, but also you can see it exacerbated the major problems that you see with women after a heart attack, which is much higher mortality in that early part um, after a heart attack compared to men. So what are we going to do about this? We've actually been working with collaborators right around the world around this particular group of people that we call Smurfless, so no standard modifiable risk factors, nothing better than a name to actually get a bit of attention, um, or a little blue man, which also helps, apparently. But what you can see is that um, these individuals are actually missing from trials and guidelines. When you look at your table one from a classic cardiovascular trial, you don't actually see these individuals there and you can't derive them from the proportion of individuals that have high blood pressure or diabetes. So I'm just going to go back one there. The algorithm you see, which I don't expect you to read on the right, is the kind of thing that Jen or Scott would have got when they went to their GP to see their risk of having a disease. But actually they were developing fundamental atherosclerosis underneath it that we were not able to see. And despite having a clean bill of health from the algorithm, we still are in a situation where we're helpless to identify the underlying plaque. With the advent of non-invasive imaging now, we think we could actually get closer to this. But this is not suitable for screening in the same way that cancer might be. As I mentioned, we're working with colleagues around the world to try to figure out how to pick out the little red dots, like Jen here, who are predicted to be in the low-risk group from a framing and perspective, but actually have underlying plaque. And we believe that the time is right for us to catch up with our cancer colleagues to be able to come up with blood-based biomarkers to actually pick up the plaque in its earliest phase so that women and men can actually get the best possible treatment. It seems feasible with blood passing through the coronary arteries at such a high rate that markers must exist. And with current molecular technologies, as well as machine learning, we think that the, there's future um, hope for this in the next five years or so. And why does this matter? Because we've actually got incredibly effective treatments to completely prevent heart attack. If we can detect plaque early, we have the treatments that stop, cause remission of plaque, so you could actually imagine a world without heart attacks for both men and for women. 
Now, slightly back to topic, coronary artery disease in women, and particular acute coronary syndrome, how is it different to men? And does that actually result in any kind of different treatment? Women undergoing angiography do have more diffuse patterns of coronary disease, and because of the nature of angiography, sometimes that looks like they don't actually have much plaque at all. But in fact, if you then do intravascular imaging, or in fact the CT image, you actually see the diffuse nature of that plaque. And very commonly, the acute coronary syndrome is, is often due to erosion rather than actually plaque rupture with classic thrombus. Similarly, microvascular dysfunction, particularly in postmenopausal women, can actually be a major issue, worsening outcome after heart attack. Now, Clara Chow here is a colleague of mine from Sydney, who's actually been a pioneer in really highlighting the poor outcome of women post-acute coronary syndrome. And as you can see in this paper that was published in the MJA, this is partly related to worse access to coronary angiography, longer time in terms of getting to revascularization, but also they were less likely to receive statins and cardiac rehab referrals. So it's a multifactorial problem that we as a community need to address. This was associated with an over two-fold risk of death at six months in these women. So this is preventable. It's not just an Australian thing, and our colleagues in America have actually recently published this data demonstrating that secondary prevention agents that we know work are not getting to women like they are to men. So what can we do about this? We unfortunately are still seeing underrepresentation of women in clinical trials, and I think as a result, guidelines are not necessarily reflecting the differences in biology and particularly sex and gender. So despite the fact that legislation in the 1980s mandated the inclusion of women in clinical trials, we're still seeing far less than we'd, we'd hoped to. I was very lucky, in fact, just before COVID, to visit um, New York for the final writing of um, the Lancet Commission for Women in Cardiovascular Disease, which was led by this amazing interventional cardiologist, um, Roxana Moran. And I'd really love you to all have a read of this depth um, article, which really talks about some of the solutions that we can actually take going forward. With regard to cardiovascular subtypes, ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of cardiovascular death, and it is preventable. Hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes are actually all things that we can treat. But in addition, with both females and males, we need to think about smarter ways of early detection and actually treatment of an incredibly preventable condition. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>